So if you've been following my live streams, I like playing video games. And one of the video games I so recently got into is Road 96. Road 96 is a hitchhiking simulator to say the least, but it's so much more than that. And today, I'll be giving you a breakdown on the plot and what I thought of it. I 100% of the game, so I could feel like a big brain when talking about it. So keep that in mind. You play as a series of randomly generated teenagers, with some having more than others, whether that be money or even a car. As this hitchhiking teen, your end goal is to flee your home nation of Petria, as its oppressive laws and a strict regime of T-Rex rule have made the country unbearable to continue living in. As you flee Petria, you run into a colorful cast of characters, changing their lives for the better or worse, depending on your mood. The varying characters you'll run into on your attempts to cross the border can range from fellow crosser teen Zoe, or even trucker John. The game is based around random encounters, and that the player will run into around seven reoccurring people, technically six based on the standards of the game, as one of the character plots follows twins, Stan and Mitch. There's no set timeline as to which characters you'll run into first, but there are storylines that progress as you go further into the game, and eventually all the stories merge in the game's climax on Election Day. Now if you don't want spoilers for the game, tune out now, because what I just gave you was a brief introduction to the premise, but if you're ready for the whole explanation for each character, spoilers included, then sit back and relax as your regularly scheduled program will begin. So due to the weird nature of the game, and how the story can be told, we'll break down every storyline for each character and ending. Starting with Alex, as he has one of the highest chance encounters on a fresh game. When you think of Alex, think of Hero from Big Hero 6, but annoying and hates his mom for no reason. Oh, also his youth sling is annoying, homegirl. Am I just getting old? His adopted mom is another plot essential character, Fanny, a cop, who has conflicting feelings about the current leadership. Alex can be influenced further, dividing him from Fanny based on the player's decisions. Alex can be found riding buses and communicating with a mysterious figure intermittently on his phone and computer, or just loitering and committing crimes at your local dive bars, leaving you to catch the flack. It's revealed that Alex has fallen in with a subjectively bad group of freedom fighters slash terrorists called the Black Brigade. The Brigade, now classified as a terrorist group, is blamed for the equivalent of Petria's 9-11, where a mountain collapsed at the border and killed a lot of civilians. More on that later. Alex, now teaming up with the Brigade, aids in their rebellion against Tirak for information on his biological parents. The player character is given the choice of supporting Alex's decision to build the bomb, or giving it up for a less violent path. He's a young kid, and impressionable. I like him because he was unlikable a lot of the time, but also just trying to do the right thing. He's surrounded by adults, all telling him lies, and he just wants the truth. So when you're a like-minded youth just giving it to him straight, he shows his real inner good. Alex's bio parents are revealed to have been part of the Black Brigade, the group found responsible for the collapse that killed so many people, and ultimately themselves, directly having built the bomb in 86. It's unsettling news, but drives the relationship between Fanny and Alex even closer, if you're going down this route. When you're with Alex, expect to be in the mindset of doing trivial tasks of fixing his phone or fixing his phone. Alex was okay as a character, his progression is what really got me to finally like him, which I think is just good writing. Every time I encountered Alex before I had the big picture, I would let out an extra long nose sigh before progressing to help Alex design a game, or beat him in Pong. Fun fact, it's heavily implied that Alex is the creator of Pong within the Road 96 verse. We're going to take a break from Alex's story and jump over to the next character, Papa Bear John. John can be encountered getting angry at payphones or wandering drunk through the desert. Papa Bear has a sad story, having lost his wife in the collapse and some of his fingers. Life just hasn't had the same color ever since her passing. John is a trucker hauling produce like pineapples and adult diapers and other things, all over Petria, as he loves what he does. As we progress through the story, it's revealed that John is the leader of the brigade and the mysterious figure Alex has been communicating with on the other line, aka Mr. Yu. John is opposed to the bomb Alex was going to build, by the way. The bomb was requested by Robert Winters, co-leader of the Brigades who has a more violent side. John's the one who asks you to convince him off the ledge through his ham radio. John has one of the fullest stories, and a lot of the events that take place on a larger scale sort of all tie back to this one guy. 
Throughout your Petrian travels, you'll see posters offering an increasing reward for information on an illegal radio, broadcasting brigade propaganda. The regime has been unable to locate this radio almost as if it's moving. You can't turn John in, I tried out of morbid curiosity, but it does do a nice job of hiding this. It's been 14 years since the collapse and John is still haunted by the memories, and it shows. However, he has found a little happiness in another person. That's right, baby, this game has a romance plot, woot woot. John has been communicating with what seems like months with a woman over his truck's ham radio. It's revealed after the discovery of the illegal radio that the woman on the other line is a cop. You know how when there are two big name actors in older murder mystery movies and one of them is a killer and the other one is a detective, but you don't know who the killer is yet? Well, if one of the actors is the detective, you're kind of already in the know who the killer is going to be. That said, the cop is Fanny, Alex's adopted mother. John's story is exciting, going from helping him to get the courage to love again to highway shootouts. It's weird though, because John doesn't give the player a real gun because it's against the law. Funny, huh? I believe this is because John is a strict pacifist unless necessary after the collapse. John's activities are fun for the most part. You get to play a part in the brigade operations whenever he's around. We're going to be taking a break from John's tale and hop over to the Fanny storyline. Fanny is encountered most regularly through being pulled over with your stolen cars and engaging in a high-speed chase to catch criminals or using a public transport to take teenagers to a labor camp where they're essentially lobotomized. Fanny is an interesting character because on the other end of the spectrum is John. Fanny is a part of the Tirak regime and the oppressive nature of the police force is one of the main complaints from the citizens of Petria. John is a freedom fighter and Fanny a cop. They couldn't be any more different, but at the same time, their relationship seems to be more believable than most. It's up to the player character to push Fanny to question the regime and break loose of those metaphorical chains, or kind of just go with it. Fanny's whole deal is playing cat and mouse with John, and mildly inconveniencing the player with legal shenanigans, such as hunting down John at a motel. The player character can also observe how Fanny is desperately worried about Alex, but gives him the space to not lose him entirely. She's an interesting character that sets up a lot of fun on Road 96. Fanny's relationship with Alex and John is the most tied to her character, and like I said with the other two, they'll all collide on election day. She's what I would describe as a soft villain. She's trying to be a comic book supervillain, but just can't. She's too nice. This next one's gonna be a little tough, and not because I'm emotionally attached to the character. Quite the opposite. This is by far my most unliked character, Zoe. Oh, Zoe. Let's talk about Zoe. When you first meet Zoe, she's being yelled at by a respectable businessman with accusations of theft. When you finally manage to get a room after all that, she wakes you up to play trombone in the middle of the night, and then of course you get kicked out of the trailer park for it. She then proceeds to tell you in the morning that she's not looking for company on her travels and ditches you after all of that. Later, Zoe is riding in a couple's van when they're pulled over for speeding or something. Zoe proceeds to insert herself into the situation after the couple offers, successfully I might add, to bribe a cop to continue doing something illegal. Zoe is taken by the cop and you are heavily shamed for not attempting to help her. When you next see Zoe, it's at a gas station and she's handcuffed to a police van. She of course asks you to help her, but you fail, dummy. The cops capture you only for Big Dick Bear John to come in with the brigade troops to save her, not you her. They make this very well known. Oh, why Zoe, you ask? Because her dad is the Minister of Oil. And for those of you who don't know, in Road 96, it's like the equivalent of the fucking Vice President. After the encounter, Zoe is shown being recruited into the brigades by John. The player then proceeds to be arrested regardless of any choices on the next run, maybe to show the risk of fleeing, or something, I don't know. It, it feels dumb not being able to get a perfect run. On the next run, you go all the way to the border, and when you're about to pass into the border crossing zone, Zoe ambushes you with a jump scare. You're then forced to walk at the pace of a turtle behind her. Zoe adds to your collection of sick graffiti without asking, and then demands you make a campfire for her. She sits back as you bust your ass and you make her her dumb fire. Major plot bomb, Zoe has been given classified government documents that reveal the brigade was not responsible for the collapse, but it was the work of the Tirak regime. The mountain had been rigged with explosives to prevent avalanches, but Tirak detonated them all, thinking he could eliminate the brigades and the civilian crowd below. After this, Zoe says hit the hay, and you both go to sleep. You won't believe what happens next. Zoe the Flake is gone again, leaving just a note saying thanks for everything and good luck. When you leave the cave to get to the border crossing, you must move a big rock and there's a Walkman underneath. It's Zoe's, of course. 
No more than five seconds later, you find her just trying to buy a new one from a scalper. Zoe is excited to see you, I don't know why, and you return her Walkman. You can say she hurt your feelings, but that doesn't seem to matter to her. She drags you to her tent in the brigade camp off the border. You both listen to the signal from the brigade stating that a truck will crash into the border wall at 3 a.m. You cut to a truck doing just that, and you and Zoe are now running together for freedom. Stuff happens, and it comes down to a single decision of saving Zoe and sacrificing yourself, or just kind of leaving her behind. I did both, and honestly, leaving her feels a little better than letting yourself be killed, even with the government documents. Zoe's story is interesting though, and in the fact that she doesn't necessarily make it to election day based on the player's choices. I'll explain her role in election day when I get to that portion though. Where Zoe's independent, and John, Fanny, and Alex all have each other, these last three characters I'm going to talk about all have storylines that converge on election day as well. Sonia the news reporter, Stan and Mitch the highwayman, and Jared the taxi driver. Let's continue this journey with Sonia. Sonia bases her reporting on fake news and biased information. On my first run, I thought I would slowly be able to convince Sonia that her way was wrong. This kind of happens after I already did all the heavy lifting on election day. But by then, it's too little too late to have a serious impact. Sonia's activities include acting as her camera person, attending a festival, and riding in her limo throughout the Tirac protest. Her character is fun just because of all the interesting places it takes you. When you're at the festival, you can play minigames, talk to people, and rack up some serious cash. When you're the camera person, you get to watch firsthand the account of police brutality on some protesters. You even get to do some deep throat investigative journalism with her assistant, Adam, at a hotel. In this one, it's your job to try and guide Adam through a successful brigade entrapment sting. Sonia is attempting to get photos of Robert, who's never been documented. It goes wrong, and things get exciting. Adam either gets thrown off the roof or doesn't. Up to you. He lives either way. Sonia is one of the worst people in the game based on pure personality, but her events sure are fun. Sonia is haunted by the past, and only by getting super drunk is she willing to confront these feelings. During Sonia's coverage of the collapse in 86, there was a girl nearby who Sonia tried to save, but was unsuccessful. And she still is really messed up about it. Next up on the chopping block is the dangerous duo, Stan and Mitch. Stan and Mitch, how would I describe them? They're fine. I wasn't overwhelmed by the character development and their overall actions in the story. When I think of Stan and Mitch, I feel like there should maybe be something different there. A lot of the time you're just driving around with them. Don't get me wrong, you get to do some fun stuff too, but for how the characters are designed, you expect a little more. Activities with the twins do include driving, but you also get to try to help them prevent a murder. That's right, a murder mystery plot is introduced, and you use the clues they've gathered to unravel who the suspect might be. My favorite scene, however, is the Pulp Fiction scene, where you have to help them rob a diner and make a great escape. They manage to track down enough details of the case to deduce that they would-be murderer is driving for the Happy Taxi Company. With the player's help, you can unveil the identity together, revealing that it's Jared. This takes us on to our final, and probably my favorite character, Jared. Jared is a freak, first and foremost. This dude is weird and he's not all there. And he'll straight up kill a kid, no fucks either. Let me give you Jared's history though. He had a daughter back in 1986, but she was killed in the collapse, and now he's on a warpath for revenge. Jared has been planning for 15 years the assassination of Petria's most famous news reporter, Sonia Sanchez. Why, may you ask, would this grieving father try to take his rage out on Sonia? Sonia and Jared's daughter were in close physical proximity during the collapse, and Jared believes that Sonia didn't do all she could to save her, in turn, letting her die. Jared hates the brigades, seeing them as the people responsible for stealing his daughter away, Lola. Lola joined the brigades, and now he thinks the brigades is responsible for the sloppy bomb rather than T-Rex detonations. Jared's stories are the best, and there's always different choices that you can make rather than just being guided through some minigames. The choices in Jared's story feel high stakes, almost life and death. He's a mysterious, dangerous, and unhinged man. Jared will kill anywhere from two to three people with little to no remorse depending on the character's decisions, and there are probably a lot more that you don't know about. Jared's political alignment is a bit odd though. You can't tell if he sides with Tirac or Flores, but he's not in favor of Teens Crossing. I mostly think this is because of the danger that comes with. Also, his gun has unlimited bullets, so you know, I would just do whatever he says anyways. Jared can be found in almost every Sonya part, within the clear range of causing some lethal damage, yet all he does is seem to creep around menacingly, at the festival and at the brigade sting. Jared is sad a lot of the time, and when he's not angry, he loves watching the Petrian version of Jurassic Park because his daughter loved dinosaurs. She wanted to be a paleontologist after… everything. 
Activities with Jared can include burning bodies, vans, and evidence. He carjacks you a couple of times, but it's all good because he gives you some rides in return. Overall, Jared is a menace to Petria, but he's a menace I'm here for. Depending on the player's choices, the big ending for the trio I just described can come early, so let's talk about that. When you get to the border, after completing all their storylines, Stan and Mitch can be found talking to Adam, Sonia is giving a news broadcast in front of the wall, and my boy Jared is creeping like the goon he is. Jared is about to finish Sonia off from behind a rock he's using to hide with his gun, but Sonia is crying and telling the production assistant that a long time ago, a girl had died here. The girl was Lola, and it's haunted her every day, but since the rocks just kept falling, she did everything she could. She had to escape to save herself. Jared takes a minute and decides that Sonia doesn't have to die any longer. But before he can leave, Jared is tackled by Stan and Mitch. They even get a shot off on Jared blowing his hat off. Sonia notices the commotion and comes running to the scene. Sonia recognizes Stan and Mitch, and it turns out the three of them are all siblings. Sonia says she's so sorry to the twins for being so distant, but she's ready to stay close to her roots. Adam then picks up Jared's hat. He's vanished. This is pretty much the end of their storylines, but they can all be encountered after the fact, and we'll even make mention to the events that just occurred. Sonia said she reconnected with her brothers, and Jared's missing a hat, with a new target being Robert. Okay, and that is it. That is all the characters. I don't think you even see Flores. You see T-Rex for two seconds, but he's not that cool. Um, so now that you know all the characters, let's do a quick recap. We can then jump into the big bang that is Election Day. So John, Fanny, and Alex have their storyline, where Fanny is the love interest of John, and John takes on the paternal role of Alex, Fanny is the law, John is the outlaw, and Alex is the mini-outlaw. Altogether, there is one big happy family. Mitch, Stan, and Sonia and Jared have their storyline. Jared is hunting Sonia for the death of his daughter, the twins are hunting Jared because they're super fans and siblings of Sonia, and Sonia is just doing her own thing, trying to ensure that her career is a long and prosperous one. Okay people, this is the big day, all of our choices now lead up to this big moment, so I hope you're prepared. When you get to the crossing cave that leads to the border, you'll find that it's been ransacked, and when you exit, you're arrested by authorities. When you wake up, you're in a cell talking to your fellow captive. You can reason that you're going to be transported to the pits, that work camp that's referenced throughout the entire game. But before that, your cellmate is taken by force for a procedure. Things happen outside your cell, loud chanting and the guards come to transport you to the pits. Loaded up into the armored car, you exit the holding facility to see the place surrounded by protesters. And the armored car is your cellmate, but he's different. He has a shaved head and appears that he was given electroshock therapy, and doesn't seem to be able to talk any longer. The protesters become restless, discovering the teens are being transported and flip the truck. You manage to escape and make a break for the wall. There you discover Alex and John, and they are working on defusing a bomb that Robert had someone else design with Alex's, like, blueprints. But if he wasn't building the bomb, how did they get the blueprint? You know, I'm not going to question it. Alex found the bomb first, and attempted to defuse it to no avail. John tells the player character to try Alex's birthday, and it works. Alex asks how John knew that the code was his birthday, and he says it's because it was the code to the first bomb that Alex's bio parents had built, Stephen and Naomi. The bomb is now defused. Fanny shows up, firearm drawn on John. Alex comes in the middle of the two, saying that John is on their side. Fanny and John recognize each other's voices, and it both throws them for a loop. Alex and John both convince Fanny that T-Rex rule is oppressive, and together they reconcile and embrace. The player is then given the chance to stay and fight with the revolution or flee north to the neighboring country. Ending 1, where you fight, is subjective to how you played the game throughout by abstaining the entire time, T-Rex rule stands, and he removes the term limit for Petria's presidency, essentially making himself the sole dictator for life. If you play like a goody two-shoes though, Zoe is leading the charge for Petria, and the people are well aware of the misdeeds with the collapse, so like they know that he caused it. Senator Flores wins the election, and a new age of prosperity for the resource-rich country begins. It shames you super hard if you didn't do shit to affect the election, but it didn't act like it would throughout the campaign. I mean, like, I, if you play like a real-life teenager, but I guess it doesn't matter because you're gone. So if you made it this far, I would like to tell you a massive thank you. I know this one's a little bit longer than what I normally do, but hopefully you enjoy the format and the topic and... The way I presented said topic and format to you in a narrative video. Either way, that concludes our Road 96 exploration. There is an ending where John can be shot by Fanny. Um, and then, so basically I know I say things fast, but Flores can either take over or t keeps rolling. There is no like in between it seems like. But either way, I had a lot of fun. It was a great game. All the characters were pretty interesting. Even on the first run, I felt like they're their value there was a lot higher. 
Also, I think the replay value is there, but only for like two or three times. After that, it kind of gets a little stale and you know what to expect and you know there's like not any real danger most of the time. But either way, thank you so much for watching. My name's Gideon and if you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.